please welcome to the TEDx Sonoma County stage, Bob Richards. What's trending now is our emergence as a space-faring species. Perhaps as significant as the transition from amphibians in the oceans to the land, we are now emerging from the land into the oceans of space. You know, my earliest memories as a little boy was walking around the rocket garden at the Kennedy Space Center, looking up at those machines that took robots and humans to other worlds. I was a child of Apollo, and, and all of my generation was. We watched human beings for the first time set forth on another world. We went to the movie theaters and watched 2001 A Space Odyssey, what it might be like for our species to meet another life form so much more intelligent and advanced than us that they appeared godlike. And at the same time, we watched the TV screen and watched Captain Kirk rocketing through the galaxy in the Starship Enterprise. The future was limitless. But we, children of Apollo, three years later, in 1972, became orphans of Apollo. That program, which remarkably took less than a decade to put together, with a charismatic president that gave this nation a challenge to put human beings on the moon and return them safely, within a decade, abandoned that program in only three years. We became orphans of Apollo. That promise that was made to we kids as we grew up and graduated high school and college, it just wasn't there. My space station wasn't there. The moon colony wasn't there. It just wasn't happening. The irony of the space age is that only by going out into space and traveling out beyond Earth did we get this sense of Earth as a fragile biosphere, of a planet floating in space, ironically leading to the sense of conservation, of limits to growth. And the farther we left planet Earth and looked back, and some of the astronauts talked about putting up their thumb and covering up every human being that had ever lived except those that were in the spacecraft with them. As we went out, we began to understand that we were a member of a planetary archipelago we called the solar system, which is part of a much vaster universe. My teacher, friend, and mentor, Carl Sagan, was a principal investigator of one of those robots that first went out beyond the inner planets to the outer planets, and was able to convince the engineers at JPL to turn that spacecraft around and look back at Earth. And here we are looking back at the pale blue dot, as Carl called it, of planet Earth, that inspired a stream of consciousness from Carl as he looked at that image, at that pixel called us. He talked about pale blue dot and what we are as human beings in the perspective of the cosmos. Let me share with you that passage with Carl speaking of the pale blue dot. From this distant vantage point, the Earth might not seem of any particular interest. But for us, it's different. Consider again that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering Thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines. Every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization. Every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, Every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on the moat of dust, suspended in a sunbeam. The Earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they can become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited 
or the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel of the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings. How eager they are to kill one another. How fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit? Yes. Settle? Not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot. The only one we've ever known. Thank you, Carl. What's trending now is an awareness, a perspective of us as a species of human beings living in a vast universe. Our telescopes have given us perspectives that we are within a galaxy that's not unlike billions of other galaxies in the universe. And in the realm of galaxies of the billions, we are lost, our own galaxy is a pale blue dot among billions of others. It's a big universe out there. It feels lonely. And although we search, yet, we are still the only ones that we know. Only on Earth do we yet have proof that life has arisen. And it's only coming back to Earth that we have the sense of home. Does that feel better? Right? Do you feel it? It feels like home. It is home. But even our home is not <laughs> the place you want to be every few hundred million years. Every once in a while, a really bad thing happens to planet Earth. Ask any dinosaur. These, these asteroids are just wonderful planetary biological cleansers, and they do happen. Not only do they wipe out species, but at the same time, they have been the thing that has delivered the resources to the planet that we need to live on. The reason that we have the resources on our planet, the reason we have a technological society, is because our planet, Earth, was bombarded by billions of asteroids and comets in its early history. All the platinum, all the gold, all the silver, everything that we need, everything that we use as an industrial civilization came from space. We do live on an Earth of finite resources. We are growing exponentially and putting strains on those resources that the Earth can't handle indefinitely, but there's good news. We are not just a single world system. We have a sister world. We call it the moon. It happens to be a moon, and we call it the moon. The moon is a child of Earth. They were born at the same time. At the same time that the Earth was being bombarded by asteroids, those asteroids were also delivering vast resources to the moon. When I was a kid and I looked up at the moon and I saw the TV and Neil and Buzz hopping around, we thought it was a dead dry rock. It's not. It's a world of vast resources. Think about the moon as the eighth continent of planet Earth, an aggregator of resources over billions of years. And now there's a game changer. We know what those resources are. We've mapped its surface. We know more about the surface of the moon than we know about the entire surface of the Earth, if you include the oceans. There's a game changer that has been recently discovered. The game changer is that there's water on the moon. We didn't know that before. This is a news that only arose about five years ago when NASA crashed a probe into the south pole of the moon. And a gusher came up. There is water in the moon. Why is water important? Because water is like the oil of the solar system. Its constituents, hydrogen and oxygen, are not just the stuff of life, but the stuff of rocket fuel. So now we just don't have to bring all the fuel with us to go to another world. We can go there and refuel, stick our hoses in the dirt, 
and fuel up again. Welcome to the moon rush. I lead a company called Moon Express. We're interested in opening up the vast resources of the moon for the benefit of life on Earth and our future in space. The moon's a destination. The problem is it's been very expensive to get to until recently. Exponential technology has collapsed the cost of getting to the moon. Now what only superpowers have ever done, small groups of people, 50, with financing from a Silicon Valley type of startup, can actually reach the moon and start to open up and unlock those vast resources. We're starting small. We're starting with microlanders, little things that are smaller than this red dot. Robots that we can send to the moon as explorers, private sector commercial explorers, to look for those resources and to tap into them. The addressable market in the moon is perhaps a billion dollars in the short term, but I believe that the first trillionaires will be made from investments in space resources. There's a lot of money to be made, but as we move the economic sphere of Earth outward to the moon and beyond, we're also increasing our chances and decreasing the risk to our civilization, planet Earth. We built robots, we partnered with NASA, we got our training wheels just down at NASA Ames at Mountain View. We partnered with Marshall Space Flight Center. We used NASA's hardware and our software engineers wrote the software that these robots flew on. Here's a short video of a robot built by NASA with software designed and built by Moon Express engineers flying autonomously, autonomously in the sky. I'm going to skip that video because I'm running out of time. <laughs> but we used NASA's robots and we got our training wheels. Then we had to build our own. We unveiled our spacecraft called the MX-1 at the Autodesk University in December of 2013. We proudly unveiled the spacecraft designed by private sector engineers, and then we went back to Kennedy Space Center, that pla same place I was inspired as a boy, with our own spacecraft, and we tested our spacecraft flying at the shuttle landing facility, where only a few years before, the space shuttle had landed with its last mission. In this video, I'm going to show you a two-minute highlight of that experience of our robot flying at the Kennedy Space Center. Please roll it. Who said donuts can't fly? <laughs> Even better, we've been able to take over our own launch complex at Cape Canaveral. So we, a private sector company, have our own launch complex where we're going to be testing these moon landers and we'll be flying to the moon in less than two years. We share the facility with another commercial space company called Blue Origin. So we're able to move into this launch complex where the United States first sent its own robots to the moon we are there practicing with the private sector, doing our own. We're using exponential technologies that are making our spacecraft smaller, 
we are using exponential technologies to make the rockets smaller. Together, we can actually partner with NASA and get back to the moon at a fraction of the cost that the government could do it themselves. The public-private partnership is working not just to the space station, where SpaceX is delivering cargo, but we'll be delivering cargo to the moon for the robots and eventually the humans that will need to go there. Earlier this year, we announced that we've bought five rockets, not one, but five, and we're going to be manifested in two ro rocket launches in 2017 where we're going to try going to the moon. It's not just about going boldly and doing something remarkable like the superpowers did, like NASA did. It's about boldly staying to move the economic sphere and the social sphere of Earth outward to the moon, to give the perspective to a whole new generation of kids that I had, but to know that one day there will be kids that are born that look up in the sky at night and see lights on the moon, and then they will truly know that we are members of a multi-world civilization. Thank you very much.